ever feel like, you know, you're just kind of on autopilot, like you see something and bam, same reaction every time. Right. Like our brains are just wired for it. Totally. Turns out there's this whole psychological principle behind it, and it's way more common than you might think. We're talking about stimulus control in this deep dive. We're going deep, folks. Oh, yeah. Straight to the source. We're cracking open chapter 17 of Applied Behavior Analysis. It's got all the details on how our brains connect cues to actions. It's pretty amazing stuff. Like, it's basically how we learn, how we adapt. It's everywhere. Speaking of automatic reactions, think about the last time you were driving. Red light pops up. What do you do? Slam on the brakes, hopefully. Right. And green light. You're already moving. But you don't even have to think about it. Exactly. So is that stimulus control in action then? Like, my car magically knowing to stop. Well, maybe not magic, but pretty close. That red light, that's what we call a discriminative stimulus, or SD for short. It's basically a signal that a specific behavior, in this case, stopping, is going to get you what you want. Which is to not get in an accident. Exactly. You stop, you stay safe, you get to keep driving. So the SD is like the green light yeah. in our life. It's telling us, go for it. You got it. But here's the thing. There's also the opposite. The cue that tells us, hmm... Maybe not. Like, our desired outcome, mm -hmm. not going to happen. That's the red light. Or even just no green light at all. We call that the stimulus delta or serio. Okay, so green light for go, red light for whoa, hold up, got it. But does this, like, apply to things beyond just driving? I mean, it seems kind of specific. Oh, absolutely. Think about someone who's bilingual, right? Yeah. They might switch between languages depending on who they're talking to. Yeah, it's true. It's not like they're making a conscious decision every time. Right. It just kind of happens. Exactly. Yeah. The listener themselves, they become the SD, and boom, the appropriate language response is triggered. Wow. I never thought of it that way. So this stimulus control thing, it's happening all the time, like behind the scenes, shaping our behavior without us even knowing it. You got it. And it's not just about individual actions either. It plays a huge role in, like, bigger patterns of behavior, too. Think about how kids act in a classroom versus, say, at a playground. Oh, yeah, total night and day. Right, and it's all about context. The environment itself becomes this giant SD, yeah. influencing how they act and react. So the classroom is like a big SD for be quiet and raise your hand. Exactly, and the playground is, well, a little bit less structured, yeah. but that's where things get even more interesting. Stimulus control isn't just this or that. It's more like a spectrum. A spectrum, huh? Okay. Yeah. So it's not just as simple as SD means go, Esgelta means no go. You got it. It's way more nuanced than that. Think about when you were a little kid, maybe you called every man you saw daddy for a while, or you got your left and right mixed up. Oh, yeah. Or like <laughs> just the other day, I was helping my neighbor rake leaves, and I swear it took me like 10 minutes to realize I was holding the rake totally wrong, like totally backwards. And that, my friend, is a perfect example of stimulus generalization. That's when you respond to something that's similar to the SD as if it actually was the SD. Your brain saw that long handle and just went, raking time. Okay, so maybe my brain needs to work on those rake identifying skills. Yeah. But seriously, is some generalization, like, normal? Yeah. Or should I be hurried? No, generalization is totally normal. Actually, it's super important for learning. If we couldn't generalize at all, we'd have to relearn everything from scratch in every new situation. Talk about exhausting. Okay, that makes sense. So it's all about finding that sweet spot between being like too general and too specific, right? Exactly. And that's where stimulus discrimination comes in. It's the ability to tell the difference between different stimuli, even if they're similar, and then change your behavior accordingly. Like, you know, eventually you figured out that not every man is your dad. Yeah, good thing. But I'm guessing that both generalization and discrimination, they can both go a little haywire sometimes, right? You're totally right. Too much generalization, and you end up holding a rake backwards. But too much discrimination, and you might miss out on recognizing important similarities between things. Imagine someone learns a new skill, but they can only do it in one very specific context. Like they can only bake a cake if they're in their own kitchen, using their own oven and measuring cups. Exactly. They haven't quite figured out how to generalize their skills, so they get stuck. That makes sense. So is there a way that researchers study this whole generalization thing. Actually, there is. It's called the Stimulus Generalization Gradient, and it's a pretty cool visual representation of how much generalization is happening. A gradient, like a color gradient. 
Kind of. Imagine like a graph, right? On one end, you've got the exact SD, and on the other end, you have something totally different. The gradient shows you how much the behavior changes as the stimulus gradually becomes less and less like the original SD. Okay, so like a, a steep drop off on the graph would mean there's not much generalization happening. But a gradual slope would mean more generalization. Right. You got it. There was this one study where researchers were working with a child who would hurt themselves sometimes. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they found that the closer the therapist was to the child, the less the child would hurt themselves. But then as the therapist moved further away, the behavior would increase. Wow. They actually plotted this on a graph and it made a super clear gradient that showed exactly how the child's behavior changed just based on how close the therapist was. That's incredible. It's like... <laughs> Stimulus control leaves a literal fingerprint. But I have to ask, we've talked about the good sides of stimulus control, but what about the not so good? What happens when things go wrong? That's a great question. And honestly, it's something we all experience because like any powerful tool, stimulus control can definitely be misused or it can just kind of go off track. So stimulus control can like go rogue. What happens that does my brain just say, forget the rules, I'm going off the grid? Not really. It's more like sometimes we learn to respond to the wrong cues, like cues that aren't actually relevant to the situation. Oh, so it's like my brain is taking a shortcut, but it's leading me to the wrong place. Exactly. And that's what we call faulty stimulus control. And it can really mess with our learning, our progress, all sorts of things. OK, yeah, that makes sense. So faulty stimulus control. Give me an example of that. OK, picture this. You're studying for a big test. You ace all the practice questions. You feel like you've got it down been there. Right. But then the actual exam rolls around and mm -hmm. your mind goes blank. The worst feeling. Because you learned the pattern of the practice questions, not the actual material itself. Ooh, that's a good point. Or think about some of those really structured worksheets they use in schools. You know, the ones with fill in the blanks and all that. Oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. A kid might get really good at filling them out, but they're not actually understanding the concepts. Their SD has become the format of the worksheet, not the knowledge itself. Interesting. Because it seems like they're learning, but they're not really, right? Exactly. And sometimes these shortcuts can be tough to break, especially for folks with autism. Have you ever heard of over-selective stimulus control? Hmm. Can't say I have. What's that all about? So it's when someone focuses on just one tiny aspect of something, often a super small detail, and they totally miss the bigger picture. Imagine someone so focused on the sound hole of a guitar that they don't even realize it's a musical instrument. Wow. So they're missing the forest for the trees. Exactly. And this can make it really hard to learn more complex things or even just navigate everyday social stuff. Right, because they're stuck on the wrong detail. Yes, their brain is latching onto the wrong SD. So we've talked about how stimulus control can be a bit of a double-edged sword, right? But how do we actually use it to like help us learn and grow? How do we make sure we're picking up on the right cues and not getting stuck in those faulty patterns? Yeah, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? It is. And that's where applied behavior analysis comes in because we have these really cool strategic approaches. And one of the biggies is something called prompting. Prompting. Okay, so like giving someone a little hint. Kind of. Think of a prompt as like temporary support. It's a bridge between where the learner is now and where we want them to be. I like that analogy, a bridge. So it's like giving our brain the little nudge in the right direction. You got it. And there are actually two main types of prompts we use. The first one is called response prompts. And that's when we directly guide the behavior, like a teacher showing a student how to write a letter or maybe giving them some verbal instructions. OK, that makes sense. And then what was the other kind of prompt? Stimulus prompts. And with these ones, we actually tweak the stimulus itself. We make that correct response super obvious. Interesting. So are there examples of that? Yeah, totally. Have you ever seen those picture cards that some therapists use? They have social scripts built right in, and they can really help kids with autism practice their conversations. Oh, yeah. Like they have little speech bubbles and stuff. Exactly. So the script itself, that's the prompt. It just makes that desired response crystal clear. Okay, that's super helpful. So we're basically setting them up for success by making it easier to choose the right option. Exactly. But here's the thing, and this is super important, prompts are kind of like training wheels on a bike. We don't want to use them forever. Exactly. So the big question becomes, how do we help someone graduate from those prompts and start succeeding on their own? Yeah, how do we do that? Well, we use this really cool technique called, you're going to love this, transferring stimulus control. <laughs> I'm intrigued. Tell me more. 
<laughs> it's all about getting that learner to eventually respond correctly to the natural cue, not just our artificial prompt, right? Right, because in the real world, those prompts aren't always going to be there. Exactly. And we have all these different techniques to make that happen. Uh, quit. Hit me with your best transferring techniques. Okay, so one of the most popular ones is called most to least prompts. Basically, you start with a ton of support, maybe even physically guiding the person, and then slowly, slowly fade that support out as they get better. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So like if you were teaching someone to ride a bike, you might start by holding onto the seat and then gradually let go. Exactly. Perfect analogy. And then we have at least to most prompts. That's where you kind of flip the script. You give the learner a chance to do it on their own first. Okay. So you're showing them you believe in them. Exactly. You're building their confidence. And then if they need it, you can offer more and more support as you go. I like it. What about time delay? Does that one involve like a dramatic pause? before you give the prompt? Huh. I wish it were that exciting. It's more about slowly, slowly increasing that pause between the natural cue and the prompt. So they start to anticipate it, right? Like they know what's coming next. Yes. It encourages them to respond more independently. And then we've got stimulus fading. With this one, you make the correct choice super obvious at first. Like a big flashing sign. Uh -huh. This is the way. Ha <laughs> ha, right. But then, as the learner starts to get it, you gradually tone it down, make it less and less obvious. Okay, so like, if you were teaching a child to write the letter A, you might start with a huge A written on the page. And then you just make it smaller and smaller each time until they're writing it completely on their own. Exactly. And the cool thing about stimulus control is that it really does apply to everything. From basic skills to, like those super complex conditional discriminations we talked about earlier. Right, where the right answer depends on more than one thing. Yes, like knowing when to hit the gas or the brake depends on the color of the light, not just that there's a light. Multitasking for our brains. Exactly. Or think about reading a map. You have to factor in the symbols, the scale, the orientation. It's all about responding to a whole bunch of different stimuli at once. Wow, that's a lot of stimulus. It is. And remember those concepts we touched on earlier, those are like the ultimate example of complex stimulus control. Oh, right. Because when we understand a concept, we're not just memorizing a bunch of random facts. Right. We're seeing the patterns, the relationships. We're like understanding the deeper meaning. That's how we make sense of the world. Exactly. It's like knowing that a banana and a strawberry are both fruits, even though they look and taste totally different. Wow. You know, when you think about it that way, stimulus control really is everywhere. It really is. It's this hidden force shaping so much of what we do. It's kind of mind blowing when you stop and think about it. It is. But the best part is once you understand the basics, you can actually start to use those principles to your advantage. Whether you're learning a new skill, kicking a bad habit, or just, you know, navigating all the craziness of life. It's like having the secret decoder ring for your brain. I like that, a secret decoder ring. Well, this has been fascinating. I feel like I've learned so much today. Big thanks to our expert for, you know, breaking down this whole stimulus control thing in such an understandable way. Happy to do it. And to all our listeners out there, keep an eye out for those SDs and S-deltas. You might be surprised by what you discover.